your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. This is the podcast that's all about digital transformation. We cover everything as it relates to people, process, technology, and strategy within digital transformation. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm your host. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. We have a great show for you today. Uh, some really interesting guests, as always, and uh, a first-time guest to the show uh, is included in today's discussion. Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk through what we're going to cover in today's episode. Um, and actually, even before I get to that, you can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as the leading audio podcast platforms, depending on where you prefer to watch or listen to this podcast. Be sure to check us out on all those platforms. Every Wednesday, we put out new episodes. So today's show, we're going to cover a few different things. We're going to start off with the hot topics and some of the emerging trends in the digital transformation space. Uh, we're going to talk about childhood traits of CEOs, which will be super fascinating. I'm, I'm excited for that conversation. We'll talk about mid-managers and digital transformation and uh, in some ways how they are barriers to change. And uh, hopefully there's some good lessons and takeaways from that discussion. We'll talk about the impacts of change exhaustion, uh, not to be confused with the change fatigue, but change exhaustion. It's almost like it's cha taking change fatigue one step further. So I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on that, Kyler. And we'll get into the components of supply chain management or effective supply chains, I should say. Um, what are those components that make a supply chain effective and successful? And we'll also talk about emerging technologies that help address hiring discrimination, which that should be a really interesting topic. That's something I'm not familiar with. So we'll, we'll learn with you on that one, Kyler. And then finally, within the hot topics, we'll also talk about software that measures stakeholder trust. Um, so those will be some some interesting topics. And then later in the show, we've got a couple interviews lined up for you or a couple uh, deep dive discussions. Uh, the first being with Dean Sam, who is part of the third stage Asia Pacific team. And he's going to talk about digital transformation nuances within Asia Pacific. But actually, the discussion, even though it's somewhat focused on digital transformation in Asia Pacific, we actually get into a lot of very broad based best practices and lessons for digital transformation, especially if you're a manufacturer. Uh, we're going to dive into manufacturing related uh, transformation uh, along with that conversation. So be sure to stay tuned for that. We'll have Dean on the show uh, after our hot topics. And then third, last but not least, we will have Wayne Holtham, who is also from Third Stage Asia Pacific. He is going to, we're going to actually play you a clip from our digital stratosphere event where he gives an overview of business process mining. So if that's a topic of interest to you, I encourage you to stick around until that uh, segment later. We'll talk about business process mining, what it is, how it relates to transformation, the types of technology available to help with business process mining and just how it works, all that good stuff. So uh, he's he's sort of our, our, in addition to being the head of our Asia Pacific office, he's also our resident subject matter expert on business process mining. So uh, stay tuned for that discussion. But before we get to those guests here, what, uh, what are some of these hot topics you've got for us, Kyler? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to quiz your CEO traits with childhood CEO traits. And so it's it's actually some interesting research um, that this company did uh, that talked about kind of the origins of a CEO, childhood traits, experience, birth order, and location. Um, mm -hmm. So this is based here in the United States and um, it's a, a pool of measuring over 200,000 CEOs. Uh, so they actually hail from a surprisingly narrow geographic location that we'll talk about and then um, also some childhood experiences. So I want to get obviously your feedback as a current CEO to see if that might match um, some of your experience. So this study found that the uh, similarities include 
family size. So a smaller family usually CEOs come from. Um, they usually have a history of childhood trauma, which is pretty um, tragic, certainly. Um, and then the socioeconomic standing is lower to middle class, usually of families. Uh, and then they all shape how those grow, how they grow into leaders. So I wanted to ask you, I don't even know the answer to this question, so it'll be news to me. But when it comes to your family birth order, what number of child are you? Are you one, two, three, or four? Five, uh, one. So I'm the oldest. Well, you will be happy to know that you are in the most company of CEOs are usually the oldest siblings. Um, so when, yeah, when it comes to uh, the actual locations, they narrow it down to states. So I'm wondering if you can give us a guess for one of the top five states that CEOs come from. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with, well, I don't know. I, I was going to say California just because there's so many people there, but <laughs> I don't know if that's a, that's a good choice. I, actually, I'll go with Texas. Big no, state, Texas is not in the top five, but it is in the top 10. If mm. you be happy to know, um, want to give about, one more guess? How about, um, let, let me go with Ohio. Good job. Yeah. Ohio is actually number four on the list. Okay. Again, um, Midwest, like a larger Midwest yeah. with a heavy concentration of blue collar mm -hmm. jobs, because I think I, from what I understand, a lot of, well, you kind of alluded to this, that a lot of CEOs come from families that are lower to middle class and oftentimes manufacturing mm -hmm. roles or areas with heavy concentrations of manufacturing, you're going to have a lot of lower to mid class people. Absolutely. It's actually an interesting mix. And number two is the most surprising for me. So our top five are New York which makes sense per capita, just population. Number two is actually Pennsylvania, which I felt mm. like was a little surprising to me. Number three was California. Again, just overall population. Number four is Ohio. And number five is Massachusetts. And I am sorry to tell you that Colorado did not even show up on the list. Yeah, so. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> so there you are. You're a unicorn in that. Um, but some interesting um, pieces about a CEO uh, that I wanted to share and see if you, um, you know, shared any similarities with that overall research study. Yeah. So, I mean, other than the state I'm from, I'm from Indiana. Is Indiana? Or actually, I was born in Indiana. Is that uh, um, anywhere? Indiana is on the top 10, but it's not in the top five. So there you go. I thought you were okay. born in Colorado. I thought you were no. a native. Wow, it feels no, like no. to you at this point. <laughs> I know people think I am just because I've been here for so long, but I, yeah. I moved here when I was a kid. I was seven yeah. years old, moved to Colorado. Um, but, you know, I was born in Indiana and that's where my socioeconomic upbringing comes mm -hmm. from. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because actually everything you said uh, matches my background as far as birth order, uh, socioeconomic status. My parents were super young. They were in high school when I was born. Oh, wow. and I was born in Buck, so that that they didn't have much money at all when I was growing up. And uh, I had childhood trauma as well uh, from just a just a rough upbringing with very young parents. So yeah, uh, with getting into all the all the gory details that that sort of fits the the profile, I suppose. I was I was wondering if it would actually match or not, though, because I was wondering when you started this if it's different between sort of self appointed CEOs, which mm -hmm. I essentially because I started the company and I made myself the CEO versus yeah. a CEO that kind of works up the corporate ladder. Is there, do you know if that study covered the difference between the two or is no, it there didn't. Is it didn't cover like CEO and founder or an, an entrepreneur, if you will. Um, some of the biggest CEOs in domestically, they're even global companies that are just based in, um, in the United States, such as Yahoo, JP Morgan, um, those, you know, bigger global conglomerates were included as well. Interesting. Huh, yeah. Okay. So, Very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, but speaking of kind of that hierarchy within an organization, a lot of my research seemed to manifest in middle managers um, in this week's episode. So something that I had found is that um, that actual research study is called Don't Let Middle Managers Block Agile Transformations. And basically, it goes through how middle managers can actually be the biggest barrier to achieving your overall business results um, or overall transformation impact when it comes 
to people within the stakeholder um, upbringing of a, a transformation. So it talks about how really they are the environment owners of success, which I think is so true and honestly has always been a curiosity on, on my front because just from my personal experience within a, a corporate structure, middle managers are kind of the all and all of that, that subculture and any initiatives that might come down the corporate ladder. Um, so I want to kind of share some results of this overall findings and some tactics to make sure that your middle managers feel as though they are, you know, catalysts to making this transformation successful with you and see if you had any feedback around them. Sure. So they, they talk about three main steps is um, provide a picture of the end state and where the actual middle manager has a place at the table, um, a clear connection with incentives, and then train middle managers on what agility really means for them. So something that I, that popped out to me was the incentives piece um, and thinking about like what does that mean for them and their team and their career. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if you feel like that's a good tactic or if that's something that really as a leader even a, a middle one in the organization you should already have you know the authority and overall motivation to put into a new project um so that one was kind of sat kind of funny with me and i wanted to get your feedback around it yeah i think that uh you know it's an interesting question i i think that that is something that should be incorporated into a mid-level manager's day-to-day -day job. I don't know that you necessarily need to wait for a transformation to pave that sort of path for a vision of, of the future. Uh, but having said that, it's even more important with transformations because you're you're disrupting people's worlds and you're changing their worlds and their rules and responsibilities, potentially who they report to, and uh, you might be automating part of their job. So there's just a lot of change and turmoil that comes along with that, even if it's for the better longer term for the organization. Uh, people will often perceive it as a threat or more often than not they'll perceive it as a threat even in the most nimble agile forward-thinking organizations you're going to get that more so than most organizations realize or most leaders realize so i think that's an important uh, characteristic for sure yeah is my instinct correct in that that middle management tier can be a real challenge when it comes to successful transformations especially in a, a bigger multinational organization yeah, it is because you you know they're sort of the they, they connect the dots between top mm -hmm. executive leadership and the front lines. You, that middle layer of management is sort of the conduit to make that change happen or to make effective management leadership happen. So it's absolutely important. And there's more of them too. So if you compare, you know, it's hard enough to get executive alignment and focus right. and clarity at the executive level where there's you know sort of like the top of the pyramid and you've got a relatively small number of people. That alone is hard enough to get alignment and clarity on. But then you move down to the mid-level management and all of a sudden you've got a ton more people that you're dealing with. And at mid-level layer, you're more likely to have more diverse personalities and cultures that they're part of. They might be in different countries. Um, so you just have a, you have more diversity in a larger volume of differing political dynamics and personalities and cultural nuances to navigate. So yeah, it becomes really hard at that level. In fact, oftentimes it's the mid-level management that causes or uh, is the source of resistance to change because they themselves aren't buying into the change or they themselves feel threatened by the change. So you can't expect them to then go to their, you know, to the frontline employees to then somehow help them navigate the change effectively because they themselves aren't sold or bought into the idea. Yeah, definitely. I think I feel like that's a, a digital stratosphere podcast that I'd love to be able to dig into. Um, so stay tuned, audience, because I, I definitely have way, a lot more questions about that, but I won't hijack our, our ground control episode here to um, to talk through that. We're covering some of the hot topics this week on our podcast. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more hot topics. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, 
Our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. We're in the middle of covering some hot topics. Let's jump back into it, Kyla. Something else that's kind of on the same lens as manager impact, that middle manager, is um, a concept I I, uh, came across that's called change exhaustion. So basically what we're looking at here is a study that showed that an employee's ability to cope with change in 2020 was at 50% of pre-pandemic levels. So the tolerance for change, obviously, as everyone knows, in going through this global pandemic has been really challenging, both personally and professionally. Uh, And then uh, basically they gave some tactics on how to combat that change of uh, exhaustion through just different things you can do as a manager. And one of them I wanted to chat with you about was um, invest in rituals. So basically, it doesn't matter how big the ritual is or, uh, you know, what what level you do, whether it's an employee outing or anything like that, or just having lunch breaks together or potlucks or those types of things really kind of drive down into building a more successful, uh, you know, uh, transformational culture when it comes to middle management's impact. Uh, So something I thought about from my personal experience that kind of triggered this thought process was when I worked in a bigger corporate structure, there was this one team that would play this card game. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it was called Werewolf. And basically, you'd have to go around and ask questions and try to identify who was the werewolf um, in this big boardroom with people that you never usually cross pollinate with when it comes to overall culture. But it just created this openness to get to know people on a personal level. And we knew we did it every Friday. And our managers knew when nobody was at their desk on Friday, it was because they were playing werewolf. And I'm sure someone could have blowed the whistle on the productivity piece, but the the fact that it was just able to build those relationships and creates a pause and almost like a sigh of not having to be on all the time within a, a specific culture. So I wanted to see if, if rituals was something that you have a recommended, including in a change plan or when you are doing any sort of business advisory services, that it's something that you've seen before within your client work. Yeah, it is. And I think it's it's something that has been studied in detail, like even in other disciplines like marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, organizations that create a ritual in their marketing are more effective in reaching their audience. Uh, either in terms of the, you know, having a similar, a similar format, a certain predictable uh, cadence for messages and uh, things like our podcast coming out every Wednesday. Mm-hmm. That's a ritual that we have on the marketing side and organizations, uh, even though that's related to marketing, it's been proven that that gets through to your intended audience better. And so when you're trying to create an internal culture uh, of any sort, a high performing culture and a collaborative cohesive culture, Having that that uh, predictable set of routines uh, is is important, and that's something that we try to do too at, at Third Stage. Um, with you know, like our first Friday of every month, we do a, a Friday so, sort of a knowledge sharing collaboration workshop sort of session. That's just mm-hmm. for us internally to share knowledge and to continue to sharpen our axes, so to speak, in terms of our skill set. So uh, that's something we do and in, in, in terms of change management too, you know, you have to be repetitive, you have to be frequent, you have to reach multiple channels, you know, as you're trying to transition or, or communicate change to people. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, primal sort of, uh, I, I'm thinking of a book called Primal, uh, I think it's called Primal Branding. And they talk a lot about that uh, concept of um, just the predictability and the repetition of messages that you need to get out uh, to any sort of uh, in any sort of change or marketing initiative so yeah absolutely yeah Yeah, that's a great point i never really thought about that you know in just having that um frequency 
so consistent because I can only imagine that in a, a you know, a, a environment of uncertainty, which we've all kind of been locked in in the last couple of years, that that certainty or that commitment to either delivering an asset or being involved in a, a team building event um, can create some safety for that employee or, or that audience member. So that's really well put, definitely. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit here, um, I have five components that I found in my research of a healthy supply chain, and one of them really surprised me. So I wanted to talk through some, most of them are, are pretty you know, obvious, the right supplier, the right manufacturer, shipping, obviously all very important. But the one that really stood out to me was banking relationships. So having a relationship or understanding um, where you can get capital or afford to self-finance, um, those types of things to be able to buy and surplus of inventory um, and having that re relationship with your financial entities. So I wanted to get your reaction to that. Does that surprise you or is that something that um, you feel like should be a real pillar of supply chain strategies? Um, I would have been surprised by it up until a couple of years ago, um, but more recently, I'm not surprised just because so much of manu manufacturing and supply chain intensive sorts of organizations have so much money and capital tied up in the supply chain right now because it's taking longer to get the materials or uh, their production is getting slowed down by supply chain bottlenecks and shortages. So that's creating a cash strain on a lot of organizations worldwide. So I, I, I guess I'm not at all surprised by that. I don't know that I would have guessed that that was, that would have been top of mind or one of the first mm -hmm. things I would have thought of if you asked me, which I thought you were going to do. So I'm glad you didn't. I thought you were going to ask me to name the top five <laughs> components of yeah. an effective supply chain. I probably wouldn't have guessed that, but now that you say it, you know, benefit of hindsight, it, it, it does make sense. Absolutely. And, and the fifth one is actually kind of surprising to you, but I think it, it makes sense. Um, and it's mentorship basically. So you don't know what you don't know. Um, the, you know, timeless saying and being able to understand that from someone that's been through it, I think is an interesting tactic to, you know, just kind of come to the table and say, I'm not sure how to get through this. Can you, uh, a consultant or an advisor or someone like that, that is independent and trusted, uh, that can help you with that overall industry insight. I think it's so important, especially since the uncertainty of the supply chain, having someone actually look at all of your components and audit your overall processes to make sure they are optimized for success. I feel like now is more important than ever. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So again, sh shifting gears a little bit. So we talked we talk a lot about emerging technology, AI, predictive analytics, machine learning, those types of things, and automation, uh, and how that can enhance business practices. This research actually shows how it could lead to more employment discrimination. And they give some specific examples that I've never really considered before. Um, a lot of it has to do with, obviously, algorithms that target specific keywords, facial and voice recognition technologies. Um, self-assessment tests, which I've taken in the past and remember leaving the room being like, I don't even know what I just did, but uh, to see if they're a good fit for a particular position, those chat bots and virtual assistants looking at job applicants and actually asking them that first number of questions, uh, and then requiring prospective hires to take a pre-employment test, which we kind of talked about. So basically what, what this is saying is that the technology um, might take into consideration or take a preference to specific gender bias words, or if there is um, an issue with some sort of disability or heavy accent, they've seen that flag employees as well when it comes to face and voice recognition um, type of thing. So uh, actually the, the ADA and the, um, the uh, U.S. Department of Labor has helped to release guidelines on how you can kind of be a watchdog for your technology to make sure that you're not engaging in any discriminatory practices, excuse me. 
So I, I kind of wanted you to put your expert witness hat on for this um, this overall research and, and see if there is something that you feel like can be said or a case that can be made when it comes to an actual technology discriminating against a potential employee, which seems completely ironic, right? Because technology, just by definition, doesn't have the ability to discriminate. But the more the process, I guess, does. So just wondering your take on that. Yeah, I guess that, you know, it's a stark reminder that behind any emerging technology is a human or a, a group of humans that created the logic and the structure and the technical backbone of that technology. So I suppose if you have a flawed or, or biased perception of the world, you're going to create software that, um, that, that has the same impact unintentionally, of course, I presume yeah. in most cases, I don't think people are For creating sure. software to intentionally discriminate, but it, I think it's more of a bias thing or, um, what's that called when you, uh, not confirmation bias, but, but basically you just see, you, you see the world, the way you see it and you don't mm -hmm. necessarily see outside of that realm. And if you create software in that, with that mindset, you're going to unintentionally create uh, discrimination or, or I could see how you, you might create discrimination in that environment. Absolutely. So do, do you feel like companies can be held liable for their technology that might have unintentionally, right, discriminated against an employee? Going with my knee-jerk reaction w without having thought through it in any great amount of detail and also knowing that uh, an attorney that might cross-examine me in a future expert witness case might actually listen to this podcast in the future to try and uh, trap me or, or uh, corner me with these word, choice of words. But without the full benefit of having thought through it, I would say that yes, I, yes, I would think that organizations are probably going to be held liable um, in the same way that they're held liable for employees that, you know, are doing the same thing. It, in, in many ways, it doesn't matter, I would argue, or I could argue, it doesn't matter if it's a human or if it's a technology that's creating a bias or discrimination. Mm -hmm. The fact is the organization is creating discrimination. Mm -hmm. Now, I suppose they could point the finger at a software provider if they're using a off-the-shelf technology that has proclaimed that it, it doesn't discriminate or it isn't biased or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I don't know how effective that would be because I'm not an attorney, but um, I would think, though, that the the onus or the responsibility largely falls on the the employer and i think it's up to them to sort of snuff that out and fix the problem if they identify that as an issue honestly i i really thought you were just going to answer that with it depends so <laughs> <laughs> i probably should have because like i said now what's going to happen is an attorney from an, an oh, man. For case, it's gonna, in like years from now they're gonna come back and listen to this interview and try to use it against me in some court case in the future. So I actually would not be surprised if that happened, which is why I'm saying it here is almost like a disclaimer in case they do try to do that in the future. Yeah, <laughs> disclaimers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll have to call up Marcus Harris just to make sure, you know, we're all in, in line with um, how we talk about that. But just an interesting evolution, right, in truly thinking through the impact of these overall technologies, both positive and potentially negative. Having that awareness is really key to making sure that your organization is acting with values and integrity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I suppose if you're an organization that suspects you might have either humans or technology that is somehow discriminatory, even if it's unintentional, mm -hmm. I suppose it's up to the organization to put some sort of check and balance in place to, to identify those. So, for example, it, it could be something along the lines of if you uh, – you know, you look at your recruiting pipeline and you find that the mix of cultures or ethnic backgrounds or whatever the case may be, whatever the demographic uh, criteria might be, if you see that it's there's an imbalance there, you know that there's likely some sort of the output is not producing something that's not discriminatory. So you, that probably should create some sort of flag to dig in and understand why that is um, easier said than done, of course. But I think that's one way that organizations could counter that or protect themselves against potential discrimination. Yeah, definitely. Those checks and balances, which we all know is needed in these fully automated technology processes, there still needs to be human intervention to make sure they're they're functioning properly. So that's definitely a great tactic for anyone looking to utilize that HR tech 
um, in a you know a more automated way and just setting up those kind of watchdog policies to ensure that everything's functioning correctly. Yeah, definitely. Um, and speaking of trust uh, in your technology, we have a, one thing I wanted to cover today, which is um, a new software, which is a software from OneTrust. It's called um, and it's the trust intelligence platform, basically. And one trust is an existing software, but most of the time it specializes in things like compliance and making sure that a, a business is operating towards state or federal or global or whatever that means um, as far as compliance laws. Uh, but their newer software is actually to establish customer trust uh, through monitoring their overall behaviors. So basically the study that they did found that three $10 billion companies, excuse me, lost between 20 and 56% of their value when stakeholders lost trust. So that's something like a, a data breach or um, you know, something that showcased the, the customer that the organizations, especially on a, a global level, larger organizations can't be trusted and how to earn that back through actually analyzing analytics. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a, a really interesting component defining that intelligence between trust, which is often seen as an unmeasurable type of emotion or, or affiliation towards a brand or company, but actually utilizing those data points to measure the trajectory of a customer's trust. So we look at these types of software, Eric, and we, and we typically say, you know, that's going to be really hard to measure. But I, I wonder if you think that this will continue to be a trend in moving from those hard data points that are really obvious into moving into more of what you would kind of quantify or, or qualify, it as, if you will, as more of an emotional response to a brand or even an internal organization through software analytics. Yeah, well, in today's data-driven world that we live in, I, I'm actually a big fan of trying to quantify things that historically haven't been. So something that is largely seen as intangible or an emotional response, I think those are things that uh, still can be measured. It might be difficult. It may not be 100% accurate or 100% uh, objective, but it's better than having no data and going just strictly based on qualitative gut instincts. Um, you know, and a good example of one thing we experience as consultants where this is this is uh, proven or, or has been true for us is when we're doing an organizational assessment to really mm -hmm. sort of measure some of the cultural and organizational and communication and managerial mm -hmm. new uh, we typically will uh, measure that you know we'll try to add some sort of science to it and some sort of rigor to it even though again it's open to interpretation and the numbers themselves may not be you know as black and white or cut and dry as other more harder measures, it still can be measured and give you at least an order of magnitude of how, how one organization compares to another or how one dimension of culture or, or communication or just general leadership styles compare to, to other organizations. So I, I mean, I'm a big fan of that. I think there, the more you can do to uh, measure and then certainly learn from the, the, uh, the weaknesses or the deficiencies of that measurement system and continuously improve it. I think that's a, that's a good thing longer term. Absolutely. I think it's, it's something that we kind of talked about with John from Lockheed Martin, right? Is measuring trust has typically been on the employee side through attrition, but how yeah. do you measure customer trust? Is that through overall sales? Is that through engagement, whatever, you know, key performance metric you're looking at. But I think it's interesting to see kind of these niche softwares that come out and help you measure these non-measurable typically uh, types of, of concepts. So definitely very something that's very exciting and on that, that AI side and that emerging technology, a great way to see kind of how your customers are reacting to your overall brand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, but some fun hot topics today. And I, I think that they're, they're well set up, especially kind of our supply chain um, conversations and components of a healthy supply chain to really dig into our talks with Dean Sam um, out of our, our um, Hong Kong presence from our APAC team. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge and 
funny story about about Dean is a lot of times I'll reach out to him for our Mandarin assets to make sure that you know everything makes sense. And one time he told me he was like, well, you know, I do speak Mandarin, but I'm much better at French. And I was like, wait, what? Because he's yeah. actually from Canada. Right. Um, but is our, our presence in Hong Kong and he kind of talks through his experience in Bangladesh and those types of things, but totally caught me off guard <laughs> in, right. in, right. in understanding that. But, you know, you should never make assumptions when it comes to cultural nuances. So he's definitely yeah. a great kind of global consultant to have that lens. Yeah. And along those lines, we, we actually wanted to do this interview because we were, you know, we're obviously trying to do more to provide broad based general digital transformation best practices, but we're also trying to create more regional topics of interest. And so we wanted to do this interview with with Dean out of our Hong Kong office to in our Asia Pacific uh, organization to really focus in on some of the, the local nuances. But in the discussion, you'll we'll find that, you know, we, we end up covering things that are just very broad based. So don't don't be fooled by the, the topic at hand, even though we're we're going to bring him on to talk about digital transformation in Asia Pacific, this is broad based stuff that I'd say 80 or 90% of what we talk about is applicable to uh, the rest of the world as well. And certainly if you're in Asia Pacific, it's probably even of more interest. Uh, if you're in manufacturing or supply chain intensive industries will certainly be of interest because we'll cover a lot of uh, topics related to that. So why don't we do this? We'll take a quick break and we'll bring Dean onto the show. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. You can find new episodes of our show on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter as well as all the audio podcast platforms. Be sure to check us out there and be sure to share this podcast with any colleagues, peers, or friends that you think might be interested in this topic. I'm excited for our next guest, not only because of the topic he's going to talk about, but also because I believe it's his first time on this show. He's been on our sister podcast, Digital Stratosphere, which you can also find uh, actually three episodes every week. There's much shorter episodes, usually 10 to 30 minutes max. And, uh, more focused on one topic. Uh, he's been on that sister podcast before, and you can find that on YouTube, um, LinkedIn, as well as audio podcast platforms, but he's never been on transformation ground control. So we're excited to have him on. Uh, Dean is one of the leaders within our third stage Asia Pacific office. He's based in Hong Kong. Uh, Dean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for, for being here. And I guess just to get started, just so the audience understands who you are, maybe tell us a little bit about uh, what it is you do at Third Stage, and then I'm going to come back and ask you some more earlier questions about how you got started in your career earlier on. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm based out of uh, Hong Kong. Um, been part of Third Stage just for under a year now. Um, we got started with uh, with a first project in, uh, in Hong Kong with a... Um, energy provider in, in Hong Kong. It was, a, it was a first good endeavor, first great experience with, uh, with Third Stage. And, and I've been uh, part of the Third Stage family uh, since, um, since then. And uh, just want to mention that I've been a big fan of Third Stage since the, the very beginnings of uh, the very beginning of the company uh, four or five years ago, when I was uh, an ERP implementation practitioner. Uh, following, following you, Eric, your 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 stratospheres, your YouTubes, and uh, it's quite surreal to be to be part on to be in the, on the live stream with you right now. Yeah, it's great to to have you, and it's funny you say that because I that's how you and I met was over social media, and I know who I knew who you were, 
just as you knew who I was, I, I recognized your name. And when we were looking for uh, sort of a key team member in Asia Pacific, you were the first person that came to mind. So uh, it's funny how it, it's it's a large world, but it's also a very small world too in today's day and age, social media. Yeah, and, and the timing was great as well. I, I just came back from a, from a long project in Canada. I uh, just got back to Hong Kong and just a few weeks later, you came out reaching, you reached out to me. So it couldn't have worked out any better. Yeah. Yeah. Very good timing for sure. And prior to uh, us crossing, uh, crossing paths in that way and, and you formally becoming part of the third stage team, um, this certainly is not your first job. You've, you've been doing stuff leading up to your, your, us, you, you joining the company. But maybe tell us a little bit about your your background. How did you start out in consulting and what have you done since that time that leading up to joining Third Stage? Sure, yeah. So, well, I'm originally from uh, from Montreal, Canada. That's where I, I grew up, I, I studied. And um, right after my finishing my engineering school, I really wanted to, to explore and, and actually go to Asia. And um, I actually went there to actually study Chinese, and I did that for two full years uh, to learn Mandarin, and really loved the the region, um, the area, and I thought that was the uh, there's a lot of opportunities in Asia at that time, and there still is, of course. And I decided to start my career there, and um, got into consulting very quickly as my first real professional job in in Shanghai. Um, I was actually working under two uh, consultants who were partners in their respective firms in Accenture and, and Bain and & Company who actually got together and started their own uh, firm in, 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 in Shanghai. So got, got my experience from them. Um, so working with some top consultants. Uh, so it was a good, good, I got a good foundation there. Uh, worked for them for a few years. Then I got this opportunity to move to to Bangladesh uh, in in Dhaka, and I've been there. I was there for seven years, um, and uh, one of my biggest, um, I guess, postings there was to uh, to lead and spearhead a big change management and ERP implementation for a textile company. Mm-hmm. I spent uh, almost six years there. Uh, restructuring the organization, setting up the right processes, evaluating what are the different types of solutions out there, what is the best solution that fits the needs of the actual organization. Uh, so it was a full-blown um, change management and, and, and restructuring with the goal to set up a, a standard ERP. And that was, a, that was a big challenge. And that allowed me to really gain that that end-to-end view of what it takes to implement technology, not just on the on the technology, on the solution side, but on the people side, on the competency side, on setting up the best practices, uh, training the people, and hiring uh, people as well. Uh, want people who you know who can understand the value of information. And, and, and following and who understand best practices because you know we all know ERP is set up based on best practices. Um, so that was a great learning experience for me. And and thanks to Third Stage, what you're putting out there, uh, Eric, that uh, during that time that allowed me to to gain some uh, some knowledge and gain get some you know get some inputs on how to go about uh, a digital transformation uh, initiative and. What I really understood is it's really a people problem or it's a it's a really, you know, it, it, it has to do with the people. It has to do with roles and responsibilities, less so than than just buying a technology and and, and getting consultants in and, and doing a job for you. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And and I think there's, you know, when you look at digital transformations in any part of the world, regardless of where you, you might be, there are certain commonalities or similarities with successful digital transformations, but there's also unique cultural nuances or differences between a digital transformation that might affect people in Asia Pacific versus uh, Europe or Africa or any other part of the world. So maybe if you wouldn't mind, you know, what in your career, because you have that multinational career, you've been in different parts of the world working on digital transformations and ERP implementations. Uh, what do you see? Is some of the biggest differences 
in managing or being a part of a digital transformation in Asia Pacific compared to other parts of the world that you've worked in? Well, the organizations that I've uh, been part of both, let's say, uh, in the US and Canada or, or in Asia, whether it's in um, Bangladesh where I was or, or in China uh, or in, 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 in Southern Asia, I think uh, what we found out is um, in, in Asia, you see a lot of mother companies who have, um, you know, who have purchased or acquired different subsidiaries over time. And these subsidiaries are actually different businesses. And uh, one of the challenges that uh, to, you know, when you deal with these clients is to be able to try to help them consolidate their, their business model. Um, although their different subsidiaries can be operating differently, but it's also worth looking at what are the consolidation opportunities that they can get, whether it's on the financial consolidation piece or whether it's on the sales and marketing, whether, you know, different, uh, you know, to, to define the different synergies that can, that can, can exist between, uh, between the different subsidiaries, um, you know, to help, uh, to help, to help their market. So, uh, so it's also, it's looking at. At the overall picture, right, of, of 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 the organization, and not just looking at different businesses in in in, in siloed. And I think, of, you know, at third stage, we do a good job to really understand uh, the different, you know, the different dynamics that exist in this particular organization, and to find, you know, the the uh, the connecting factors that can help uh, connect these uh, these different subsidiaries under one umbrella. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good a good point. And you you mentioned uh, you know one thing one thing with with digital transformations in in Asia Pacific is uh, and I think you may have alluded to this a little bit is sometimes the the impact can be different you know from a cultural perspective. Um, are there any differences you see in terms of just the cultural? impact that digital transformation might have an, on an organization or, or a team that's in Asia Pacific versus other parts of the world? Well, I would say um, from my from my experience, um, several organizations that I've been interfacing in uh, in the region, a lot of companies are very execution based, right? And, and in order to, let's say, to get into that digital transformation, let alone the ERP kind of uh, system, is you need to build that that planning infrastructure. So you need to, you know, sort of a bit step out from that execution level where you have like only a, a couple of weeks planning window, but to look a bit further beyond that that horizon and build an infrastructure, build a team that that doesn't execute, but that really looks at the information, that collects the information, that compiles it, that analyzes it to make the right decisions. Uh, to plan, and then with a right planning output, then the execution team can can start, uh, you know, can can perform the task at hand, and they, they do it more much much smoothly because. It so so is 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 developing that that planning structure above that execution. Oftentimes, what I see in uh, in the region is, but the execution teams in organizations are are really really strong. You know, they they work really hard. Uh, they put to to meet customer demands and forth. But just by adding that that planning layer on top of it, that can bring a lot of uh, benefit to the organization and and allow the company to. Right. Yeah, and that's. Uh... That's something that I think organizations and teams in any part of the world could really benefit from that, that sort of lesson or I best practice. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that also in, in, in companies, uh, not just in not just in Asia. Yeah. Yeah, but it but maybe it's something, and I'm always fascinated, in, and you've been very good at helping me understand these, some of the nuances in terms of when we when we're interacting with our clients in Asia Pacific, you've, always, you've been good at coaching me on sort of the cultural ways to navigate, you know, the differences between just Western culture and, and uh, some of the cultures in Asia Pacific. Do you think that culturally in different parts of the world that there are different 
propensities or likelihood or, or uh, different tendencies to want to do more or less planning like you're suggesting here? Do, do you think that's a cultural thing? Like some some cultures in the world want to plan more, that's, it comes more naturally, but other cultures maybe just want to go straight to execution? Or what do you, what do you think drives that? I think it's just... Um just a bit of knowledge transfer that's required really it's not just the you know if if they knew if they if they had a good idea of what it takes to plan you know what are the the right uh, the foundations that that you need the right bolt uh, you know, nuts and bolts required to plan they would do it so it's just uh providing that that level of, of knowledge, those extra processes to put in place, the extra pieces of information that need to connect together in order to perform uh, proper planning, whether it's, it's it's material planning, it's capacity planning, it's it's demand planning, and 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 so forth. It's just it's just giving that extra um, those extra instructions, I, I would say. And then once you give that, uh, teams usually. Uh, you know, they, 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 they accept it and, and they, they use it for their own benefit. Right. Yeah. Very good. So when it comes to, um, your work at third stage and, in, in advising some of our clients in the Asia Pacific region there, um, what do you enjoy? What is it you enjoy most about the, the type of work that you're doing with these clients? Well, really, I, I really enjoy the fact that I'm, I'm helping organizations get better. You know, that's mm -hmm. deep down. That's uh, it. Br I bring it brings a lot of satisfaction to me that I know that you know I'm 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 able to contribute uh, somehow to to help the organization, not in a specific department or a specific need in terms of you know having to um, fulfill customer needs or customer demands, but more on you know on the holistic management uh, point of view, you know, trying to connect dots uh, between uh, the different functional units of the organizations, uh, you know, to create that, uh, those different synergies, uh, connecting uh, different information streams, you know, to, you know, so those, that's, I, I really enjoy that. And, you know, we, uh, of course, we perform a lot of workshops uh, with, you know, with our clients, uh, whether it's with um, functional teams, uh, the execution teams, the planning teams, and as well with the, you know, board of directors and, 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 and the senior management. And, and I really enjoy um, preparing, uh, running these workshops and gathering their, their, their inputs, right? Because they're the ones who know the business the best and, and they're the best ones to talk about it. But what I enjoy is after the workshop is actually compiling the notes that we've taken listening again to those workshops or whatever they said and, and taking notes and then from those notes connecting what's the right you know what's the what's the right way forward for them and presenting that to them to the, uh, in the next meeting so those are the that's the, the 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 greatest satisfaction that that i get because i mean we won't reinvent their business i think our job is to take what they know about their business or what they think what they believe is right for the business, but trying to show it in a way where it's consumable, where we know we can break it down into parts um, and show how we can go about it. And that's what I love about uh, about what I'm doing right now. Right, right. Well, good. Well, that is exciting. That's, that's part of what makes consulting fun, for sure. Um, I wanted to come back to the previous uh, point uh, you, you were talking about planning. And we actually have an audience question that I wanted to, to show you here and, and to get to. And this is from uh, Glass on YouTube. Um, and Glass asks, can you explain how execution feeds back into planning and how you might adjust your planning methodologies to reflect the realities of execution? So that's a nice way to tie together the point you were making before of, you know, the, the making sure you take the time to do the planning. Certainly execution is important, but how do those two things, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, tie those two things together? Right. Well, that's that's a great question. Um, so if you want, I mean, yes, we all know planning feeds into execution, but you also need that execution bit to feed into planning. Um, so, well, one thing is uh, you need to capture the, the execution data, right? And in real time, uh, if it's in real time, the, be the better it is. Um, 
so so the planner can react better and 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 adjust his his plan so uh let's say if we're talking about manufacturing you know to have a good uh, manufacturing execution system right to be able to 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 track um inventory uh in real time to track production in real time to track capacity in real time to try to track um shutdowns you know maintenance shutdowns uh, in, in real time so 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 that information can uh, can feed back into planning for that next uh to adjust the next planning cycle and I, and i believe another piece of it is more on the improvement side of it right so you know you know for example if you're implementing an erp what you should be looking at is is the reporting piece and trying to evaluate what happened between plan and actual right and 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 evaluate the variance between the two and once you get that variance then you see how to better plan and even how to better execute so because both areas you can improve uh simultaneously but how you improve that is you can correlate uh the two of them together you know develop those right reporting dashboards in order how plan and execution uh you know worked out uh in relation to to one another and then uh yeah and then you, you you will get the most out of your your information right yeah makes total sense and they they have to they have to be aligned and they have to um integrate you know and feed one another for sure when you're talking about planning and execution uh, and in a similar follow-up question while we're on this topic here this is from from kyler um on linkedin who asked when working with multinational organizations how do you effectively address individual cultures while keeping an aligned and standardized implementation strategy? Um, and this is kind of an interesting, maybe even a broader question in terms of, you know, your operations, your, uh, the technologies you use, you know, how do you, how do you leverage best practices and um, sort of repeatable processes, but at the same time balance the need to tailor those approaches or those implementation strategies for the unique cultural mm -hmm. consideration? How, mm -hmm. how do you how do you find that right balance or what have you seen work in your career well i'm a a big uh believer in the process ownership model mm. uh, i really i really believe this is uh the next way forward in order to drive uh consistency um of of to operate throughout uh throughout the businesses of uh in the multinational or, or multi-sites right so 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 what is a process ownership model really so it's uh regardless it's, it's a process owner and re, uh, who's looking after a, a specific process at all in all different bits uh, well in in all across all divisions or business units across the the, the mother company so is someone who's looking at after if if the right uh, processes the right methodology is being put in place uh, and it's make and making sure that it's it's being done consistently throughout the organization, and, and I believe this is a, a way to uh, properly leverage value of your let's say your ERP system. Um, so so having process consistency is great, and this is something this is sort of like a buzzword that we that 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 that's been uh, shared you know for for quite some time. But in order to make that happen is you really need to have, it becomes a, a person's issue, right? A people issue. So you need to have a person that's really responsible of that process and who has uh, also the, the seniority as well to, 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 to ensure the functional teams are actually running that process as it should be uh, across the globe. Right. And now with, uh, now, you know, with, with, uh, with new technologies such as process mining, uh, you process owners can have that visibility to track how processes are being performed uh, across their business. Right. Sort of along those lines, though, I have a question that, that your response just triggered another follow up question of mine, which is when you have certain cultures that are some, some cultures, as you know, are, are more uh, hierarchical. You know, they, they respect authority and they listen to authority and they want uh, sort of strong authority from the top down. And then other cultures, that's not as well received and it's more of a less of a hierarchy and more of a flat organizational structure. 
when you're dealing with differences like that, in, in especially in the context of what you described with the process ownership and, and that sort of thing, does that change how you navigate that? You know, when you're looking at it, sort of core fundamental differences in how people view uh, authority and leadership roles and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think so, because when you're looking at a process ownership model, it, it becomes more cross-functional, right? Uh, right? Because to have process ownership, you have to look at your organization as a uh, in terms of end-to-end -end processes. And another term for end-to-end -end processes is cross-functional processes, right? It's not just a, a per procurement department or sales department, um, a production department, uh, materials department they, they are linked together in one uh, streamlined process and that process owner looks at that overall uh, streamlined process right that cross cross functional process so so therefore yeah the process owner has to uh, be able to cut across these I guess these functional barriers and 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 to uh, again to have that that seniority level to 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 work with the heads of these functional teams um you know to ensure the process is is is, is running smoothly right uh, yeah so having a hierarchical uh kind of organizational structure uh could impede that kind of model so it requires a bit of of, of, of you know of tweaking i guess uh mm -hmm. to to have that process owner jump in to ha to have a a proper seat in that in that organizational structure to perform right we're here at Dean Sam talking about digital transformation nuances within Asia Pacific. We're going to take a quick break and we'll continue the conversation when we return with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. We're here with Dean Sam talking about digital transformation within Asia Pacific. Also from LinkedIn is, can you give an example of a process owner and who should own this? So in other words, who would, who would own the, the process ownership or the process lead function? Well, uh, let's say if we are talking an example of a process owner, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about the planning, building a planning infrastructure. And I, I, I believe that's where the first, well, let's say the key process owners would, would come in, right? Because uh, a process owner, where he would come in is making sure you have different information streams uh, trying to, well, to consolidate in one, in one common point to make the right decision. So the process owner has to make sure that all these different information streams are providing that information to, for example, the planner, right? So that would be that would be a, a an example of a process owner who is making sure that if it's a if you have information coming from from the demand team, you have information coming from the procurement team, you have information coming from the um, uh, uh, production team, and 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 so forth from the from the costing team, you have all these information streams come in the process owner will make sure that information is coming in properly so uh, the planners can do can can do their job right. right so basically the process owner what he's making sure is to remove all types of ball information bottlenecks that are happening in the process right so yeah. so so things can work smoothly and no one's actually waiting for information to come to them so they can execute their task right yeah Makes sense. And then uh, something unrelated to, to planning and, and business process ownership is, is from uh, Nav on LinkedIn. And he asks, what are the most common signs that come up during ERP implementation that indicate it may not be 
as successful. And I think this is probably a, a question that goes well beyond just Asia Pacific, but just in general, or if you have any nuances or anything that's sort of unique to Asia Pacific, I'd love to hear that too, but if, otherwise we could talk more generally about it. And um, well, I would say, um, you know, when you look, when you, the, the, the traditional way to look at, you know, ERP implementation, you build your as is process and then your to be process and you start, uh, you know, you, by doing that, it, it's helpful because you start connecting the different departments together, uh, information's flowing across the organization and, and yeah, and then you, you're able to, um, you know, you, you're able to deploy a system where, you know, it, it meets, you can say the end to end piece of the organization from, from order to cash, for example. Uh, I think one area that's, that's often missing is that reporting piece and that uh, analytics piece. If you can do that, if you can design that ahead of time during your, your readiness stage, uh, before you deploy your, your, your implementation, you'll get much more out of your ERP investment, I would say. So working with the, the executives uh, and so forth and building the, the, the analytics, the modeling, the type they like to, they like to develop in the, in the company in order to make better stri strategic decisions later on. That's important because once you, you understand what you want to analyze, what you want to model in the, uh, about your business, you have then you'll figure out oh we need this kind of information to model this information and where does that information come from though that comes from your erp implementation so if from your erp so you so therefore oh okay good thing we didn't set up the erp yet because we don't have that information so then you can include that in that data set that you require for your analytics in your erp processes uh so so it's very important to look at both ends so you start from you know the, the the process piece on how the you know the organization should run right on the planning on the functional level but also look at the other end of the spectrum in terms of analytics and reporting what you require because that's also going to feed your your erp requirement needs right yeah it makes total sense now shifting gears a little bit if we talk about um specific technologies or types of technology whether it's erp like you've been talking about or crm or artificial intelligence, business intelligence, uh, business process mining. There's all these different tools out there that can enable a digital transformation. Are there certain trends or um, priorities that you see being different in Asia Pacific? So in other words, there's a predisposition towards certain types of technologies more commonly in Asia Pacific than what you might see or expect to see in other parts of the world or, or, or is, it, is it more similar than I might think? Well, I believe in in Asia Pacific. Uh, well, the clients that are that are approaching us, um, they're still very focused on implementing uh, their ERP. Whether it's their you know the it's their first time, or they want to replace uh, their current ERP, their legacy systems. I think that's the foundation uh, with your ERP, uh, and if you can leverage that to to the fullest extent, then you can move on to the different. Uh, other platforms that are that are out there, but I, I you know, the ERP is really the, the the foundation of of all, I guess, business management. Right. What about what about the um, the priorities or the things that drive company strategy? Oh, I'm sorry. I lost you, Dean. I, I lost your audio there for a second. Can you repeat that last part again? I think, well, our goal is to really build that digital strategy in order to really leverage that, that ERP piece. And, I, and once you have that ERP piece set, I think the, you know, the sky's the limit afterwards. Yeah. In terms of, 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 of introducing other pieces of technology. Right. What about the, um, the drivers or the the uh, priorities that are driving organizations to want to go through digital transformation or the benefits they expect to get out of digital transformation how is that different do you see you know for example in you know in the united states and other parts of the world it's very focused on how do i optimize efficiency 
and uh, increased throughput, and it's and it's about speed and lowering costs and things of that nature. Um, of course, every company is different. Every organization is different. Has their own priorities. But but just in general, if you were to generalize, what what are some of the priorities that might be a bit more unique or a little bit more of a focus with digital transformations or the, or the reasons for digital transformation in Asia Pacific compared to other parts of the world? Well, I think, uh, yeah, just to be very, very, uh, you just go back to basics. I mean, we don't want people just running around and looking for information to do their tasks. You know, at the end of the day, right. Uh, uh, this is what we, we, we want to achieve, right? And, and if you have that information visibility, that information accuracy, and that's, that's in order to do that, you need to set the or, right organizational structure, the right roles and responsibilities to, uh, and the right processes to, 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 to achieve that. Uh, I think that's the, the, the biggest pain point that, that, uh, you know, that, that should be eliminated in whether you're embarking in, in some sort of a digital uh, strategy and, and making sure that information is, 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 is flowing uh, smoothly and, and building that, um, how to say that digital mindset, right? In, 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 in throughout the organization. I think that's, that, that's key. People need to be sensitive about information. It's not just about doing work, but it's about getting the, the right information to do the right work. And I think once, if if we can, if a, a, a company can build that that culture of having, you know, of, of throughout, you know, top down in organizing, should be sensitive to uh, to the value of of data and the value of information. That will go a long way for that for that digital transformation to to occur. Right. Yeah, that makes makes good sense. You know, one one of the things I found throughout my career in different parts of the world and in being involved with digital transformation in, in varying parts of the world, is that in some parts of the world, you have, you have relatively high labor costs where it's easier to justify the need to automate or the need to digitize, digitize the business. But then in other parts of the world, the, the labor costs are relatively low, especially if it's a, if it's a company or if it's a parent company that's based in one of those higher cost locations, the, the cost of labor in some in some other countries might actually be so low that it's harder to justify larger investments in technology because you're not going to get as much benefit from automation at least at least on the surface is that something you've seen in your career or, or how have you if you have how have you navigated that well I've never heard a, a business owner say I don't want to digitalize because it's expensive and because my labor cost is is is, is low and I'm happy with my margins. I think right. any business any business owner, if they have a chance to uh, to improve their margins, regardless if they're you know they're they're doing well or not uh, right now, I think they'll 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 jump on that opportunity. Um, right. So. I mean, I, I would see, I mean, coming from Bangladesh, uh, spending seven years there where, you know, uh, labor costs is, is, is very low compared to the rest of the world. You see a lot of business owners, a lot of managers who are, who want to implement, uh, you know, a digital system to, to, to connect their, their organization, to, to track, uh, you know, to track their, their company processes and so forth. So no, there's, uh, there's a big propensity to, for, for business owners, uh, especially let's say in the textile world where, where you know, where labor, a lot of labor, well, you, you require a lot of labor, they still want to, to, to digitalize because at the end of the day, you know, they, they want to make their companies better. Right. Um, and I, I believe a, an ERP, for example, is one of the, or probably in my opinion, the biggest initiative that they can undertake in order to, to improve their company drastically. Yeah. Yeah. And we, you know, case in point, or just to give a, a real life example for uh, a client we have right now in Asia Pacific, I know you're, you're based in Hong Kong, as we talked about, which in Asia Pacific is a relatively high cost um, part of the world. And then we, but you're working with a client in Papua New Guinea, um, which is a large organization, in Papua New Guinea, where the labor costs and just overall, overall costs are, are a bit lower. So that's, I guess, a good example that sort of validates your point, which is this organization 
is interested in automating their business and introducing new digital technologies, partially to increase efficiency and decrease cost. But I mean, there's other benefits as well, obviously. Um, but I, I guess that's, do you have any thoughts on that or you, in that specific example or that specific client? Is that, is that true? What you're saying as far as the, the need and the want to automate and save money and increase margins and all that stuff you just mentioned? Yeah, uh, all of that is, is, is true. Um, is, is correct. I think, I mean, being a, a manager or, or an executive, you know, your, uh, your mission is, is to build uh, and improve a, a well-run machine, right? Uh, right? Regardless, you know, you're making money, of course, but you, you also want to see things flowing, you know, everything's in order, everything's, uh, you, know, you know, people know their roles and, and, and they're, they're, they're executing it to a T and so forth. So uh, there's no better way to do that by, by setting up that, that, that information infrastructure. Uh, because information drives the whole business. Uh, so, so uh, you know, for this, for that specific client, you know, uh, we're working with uh, the executives there, and you know, they have a they have a big vision. You know, they want to grow. They they want to be, uh, they want to be a big player, or they are a big player, but they want to be the bigger, the biggest player in in their region. Uh, so there's no way around that. You you can buy a bunch of of other subsidiaries. You can acquire and. and uh, other companies, but if you, if you don't have a common, let's say, consolidated operating model, you have different uh, streams of planning. You know there are different levels of planning that you have to go through in in, this, uh, in an organization. You have to set those up because those are the right gates that that um, that an integrated business platform should follow. So they they are really. Um, uh, invested in, in, in developing those kind of systems there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That makes, makes total sense. Are there any differences in terms of how, um, how clients in Asia Pacific interact with consultants or how they view consultants compared to other parts in the world? In other words, is there a, a more favorable or less favorable view of consultants? Are they more dependent or less dependent on consultants than other parts of the world? Or is it, is it sort of a just case by case basis? I think it's, it's case by case, uh, uh, basis. Uh, well, you know, when you, when you spend time with a client and it's a, say, let's say it's a long term relationship, uh, let's say, you know, a couple, it could be a two or three years relationship. Sometimes the, the client uh, sees you as actually an employee, not an employee, but part of the actual company. <laughs> and, and, and they're and sort of they're expecting you to <laughs> to get the work done. Like like if, if you are part of that actual part of that organization. Um, so so that's 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 interesting when you get into those um, uh, dynamics. Um, but I would say it's 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 case by case, right? Uh, of course, you have clients that are more demanding than <laughs> than than others. Um, but you know that's that's the beauty of being a consultant, right? It's it's uh, you you you're working with different organizations, you're working with different cultures, you're different, you're working with different teams, and and you learn a lot from uh, from all of those different cases. So that's one of the benefits I, I feel about, about consultant. And, and at the end of the day is you have, regardless of how much work you put in, uh, the, the client needs to be happy what you're providing them. And they see, you know, they see the light at, at the end of the tunnel, you know, from, 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 from the engagement. And then they can start uh, thinking about the next steps. You know, you, you've provided that foundation, you've provided uh the right starting point and i think that's the key thing is providing that right starting point for them so they can build on it and then they can add those other additional steps on, uh um you know on their own uh, if you know if they decide to uh you know to take on the project uh without you later on right yeah yeah it makes sense um what what for you has been the most challenging and rewarding project that you've been involved with so far, whether it's as part of third stage or even earlier in your career, what, what's been an example of, of your favorite or one of your favorites? Well, by the most challenging and also the most rewarding um, 
engagement was uh, when I was in Bangladesh. I was uh, I was actually part. Uh, I had one step, I had one foot as a consultant and one foot as an actual uh, member of the organization. And it was a, it was a textile organization. I spent five years there. Um, the, the 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 managing director uh, of of the company uh, when I when I stepped in, I asked him, "What do you want me to do?" He said, "I want an ERP." I'm like, "All right, okay, uh, I'll I'll get that rolling for you." Uh, but it, I didn't just jump in and, and look for a system right away. I had to you know review the the organizational structure. Look at the, the, the capabilities of of, uh, of the workforce. Set, set up their planning systems and and, and so forth. Build that uh, digital mindset. Build that sensitivity to information. And and it took uh, took a while to 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 get that going in order for an ERP uh, to, to to really come in and, and really start crystallizing uh, what we're about what we're doing in, in setting up the processes and and all that. And 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 going and being in Bangladesh, so you know, it's, it was a new country for me, a new culture for me. It was, it was, and I lived there for 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 uh, for a number of years, and also working six six days a week there because they only had um, they only had Saturday off. So so I, I had to work six days a week for seven years. So it was really tiring, but the uh, uh, it was really rewarding. And uh, it's been several years now. I left Bangladesh, but I. Uh, I still get a lot of uh, great feedback, a lot of comments, a lot, a lot of nice words from from my from my past uh, colleagues, and and how much uh, you know they 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 cherish the time we we work together, brainstorm together, um, and all that. So so it it has a yeah. It, Bangladesh has a has a really uh, soft spot uh, for me and. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to go back one day and and see everyone there. I was just going to ask you that. Have you been back to Bangladesh since you were working there? No, it's been almost four years. Uh, but hopefully, after you know, after this COVID uh, COVID situation, maybe I'll, I'll I'll take a flight and 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 uh, and say hi to to everyone there. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how working in another country can create. Uh, that that soft spot that you mentioned, I, I have a few of those as well, including in parts of Asia Pacific and Africa. I mean, there's still places that I've worked that I just I kind of miss, like I, I want to go back to, especially since a lot of us haven't been traveling much during during COVID. Um, so I, I agree with that. We're here at Dean Sam talking about digital transformation nuances within Asia Pacific. We're going to take a quick break and we'll continue the conversation when we return with more transformation ground control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings and the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. We're here with Dean Sam talking about digital transformation within Asia Pacific. Here's a, a general question. I guess this this is a, something I think is very relevant across the world. I don't think this is at all specific to Asia Pacific, but this is for a question, another question from, from Nav on 
uh, LinkedIn. He says, how do, how do you best mitigate delays in an ERP implementation or launch? You know, what are some of the general best practices? Certainly, if you have anything that's unique to Asia Pacific or you think is especially important to Asia Pacific, that that would be interesting, too. But I, I imagine a lot of things you, you might think of are global in nature. Uh, top of mind, the best way to, to, to eliminate delays is, um, don't sign the contract with your system integrator and your ERP vendor. If you're not ready, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's the only way I can, I, I can put it in, 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 like if it was the top of the list, just don't jump it. Don't jump into a contract right away. If. If you're, you know, if you don't have the right people yet, you know, you still have to hire your your planners. You still have to hire key key roles in your organization. Um, if you don't, if uh, your uh, your information structure isn't robust enough, you know, you you have to improve how you set up your bombs, uh, your 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 item masters, all your master data. Those are all the things, all the all the analysis that you can do before. Uh, actual system integrator uh, comes in or or uh, an ERP vendor comes in and it's worth let's say you know hiring someone from outside a third party a consultant to come in to help you uh, get that set up but don't jump in uh, and, and sign a contract because once you sign the contract unfortunately you're trapped <laughs> and, yeah. and it's hard to it's hard to get out of it so so do as much as you can <laughs> to 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 uh, before before signing the contract, and and at the end, maybe maybe you'll get pressure from from your colleagues. How where is this ERP? How come you know we've been hearing about it for for four months? How come the cons the ERP consultants are not here yet? But you have to make them understand there's a lot of homework and there's a lot of uh, setup that that can be done uh, beforehand. Right. And, and one cultural nuance that you've actually helped educate me on is within the region, within Asia Pacific, is that uh, maybe more of a propensity to want to have more preparation than maybe other parts of the world. Other parts of the world might be a little bit more comfortable with ambiguity or not having a plan, not having structure. But from what I understand from working with you and others in, in the region, it, it seems like structure and preparation is even more important. Uh, in, in that part of the world. And so that that further goes to your point, which is if you go straight to signing the contract and then you just start building stuff, you, you're not ready. You're not prepared. You don't have the structure. You don't have the governance in place. You don't have the processes in place, everything you need to be successful. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, you, I think that the, the whole organization, before you embark on, on your digital transformation or, or, or your ERP implementation, everybody should be on the same level playing field in the organization. And, and one key part is having that common knowledge on best practices understood throughout the organization. Top down, it needs to be understood. Because once you set up that common knowledge, which ties everyone together and everyone's basically singing from the same song sheet regardless if this song sheet is simple or, or, or complicated but if it's simple it's great but at least everyone can always draw back from that same from those same uh principles basically from those same uh from that same common knowledge so it's building that common knowledge in your organization first before you start you know um implementing any 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 technology so, and so it's a, it's a learning process internally for the organization, you know, to, to, uh, before you start setting up an ERP and, and spending a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. That makes total sense. And that's good advice for any project team in any part of the world, I would say. Um, I, I have one more question for you before, before I ask my, my last question for you, I wanted to cover this one question that is actually better stated than the way I uh, framed it. It's a little bit more specific than, than a, a similar question I asked you earlier. And this is from LinkedIn. And the question is, do developing countries prefer an on-premise or cloud-based ERP? And maybe not just developing, but just in Asia Pacific in general, do you see a, a difference in cloud adoption versus on-premise adoption? I know in general across the world, things are, are migrating more towards cloud, but we're not 100% of the way there yet in terms of full-on cloud adoption across all enterprises. 
in all technology. So what are your thoughts on this cloud versus on-premise as it relates to, to your region? I would say the biggest factor why organizations would decide to either go on-premise or on cloud is uh, their, how good is their internet connection? <laughs> right. I mean, if we're talking about developing countries, um, you know, you need to have a stable internet connection. Your internet providers need to be reliable. Um, so that's, uh, that's a key thing. And talking about the, uh, our project in, in Papua New Guinea, you know, uh, internet connection is a big thing. Right? It's a big deal. Um, so, uh, that's why they decide to go on, uh, to go on, to use an on-premise, uh, solution. Um, I, me personally, I don't have any bias or any preferences between on cloud and, and, and uh, or, or on premise uh, solutions. I think it's just about uh, you know, do you have the the infrastructure, IT infrastructure in your environment, in your region to you know to support an on cloud um, system. Yeah, and then along the same lines, I I don't I haven't seen this as often in Asia Pacific as I have in other parts of the world, like in Africa, for example. But one thing to be aware of too, in addition to internet connectivity, is also just power reliability. You know, one thing that uh, we see, in, like I said, in Africa, you you get planned outages where they're trying to load balance the the grid, basically the electrical grid. Yeah, and they'll take down power for hours at a time and. I guess that's a problem whether you're on premise or cloud that creates a disruption to everyone's lives and, and businesses in general, but that certainly could affect cloud adoption as well. I would think, um, you know, if you don't have internet or power uh, or reliable internet or power, that, that could be a challenge as well. Yeah. Well, you'll, then you have to get into the electricity business and, and, and set up your own generator. <laughs> right. And that's what, that's what happens in, in countries like Bangladesh. They, Actually, the company where I was working, they were setting up because they had so many outages uh, throughout the day. Uh, the the founder decided to build a small, a mini uh, plant, <laughs> electricity plant beside his 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 factory in order to 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 just supply uh, to supply electricity for his operations. It's not not a bad idea, depending on depending on where you are, for yeah. sure. I'm um, sure he made the cost benefit analysis, and <laughs> it made sense for him. Yeah, I could imagine because that's that's got to be disruptive. If you lose power for a couple hours, that that could be extremely disruptive. Um, what about so? My last question for you then is is what advice would you have for someone that's about to get started on their digital mm -hmm. transformation? What's sort of the general advice you'd give for someone or a team that's about to get started? Um, we talked earlier about building that common knowledge. Uh, setting up the basics, the best, the, the, the management best practices. Those are, that's in my opinion, that's the first thing you have to do. Um, with this digital transformation is making sure that you're, you're actually doing the right things, the, the, the basics, uh, right. Um, um, so, and I would, I would preach for, you know, for company executives, uh, you know, team leaders, managers, and so forth to uh, inspire and to uh, encourage their employees, their functional teams, their managers uh, to get training, right? Uh, certification on, you know, on, on, on key parts of you know, the processes of how to properly run uh, the key processes for, let's say, for an ERP, for example. Um, so I, I come from a, a bit of a manufacturing background uh, and the supply chain background, and I'm a big believer of, uh, let's say, certification, like supply chain certification. I did the, the APIC certification. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows about it, but it's the Association of, of Operations Management back in the U.S., and they have really good training material uh, to certify you in, in supply chain management in lean manufacturing, in inventory control and so forth. And I would preach for companies to learn, to, you know, to have employees, uh, to, you know, to get that kind of certification, to get that kind of knowledge, because that's going to allow the, really the, the company to, to, to blossom uh, properly for the, for the long term. 
and when it comes down to implementing digital transformation and bringing digital transformation consultants and ERP consultants, system integrators, and so forth, they will have the same level playing field with as as the consultants, and then they can they can you know they can work uh, off each other. The worst thing that that can happen, well, not the worst thing, but you know what you want to avoid is having consultants. Oh, this is what you have to do because that's what the system requires you to do to do so. To, to do it some way, but you need to have that other piece where, well, no, well, there's, uh, we, uh, you know, there's there's also another side to the coin to that. You know, there's uh, we do it in this way, but we're also following the best practice way. And once you follow the best practice way, that the solution will be able to 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 adjust to it, uh, no problem. Right. Right. So it's building that that internal competency within the within the organization before you you dive into your digital transformation initiative. Yeah, that's great advice because I think a, a lot of times organizations get stuck with um, the need or the perceived need to bring in outside experts, which you do need some of that, but you don't want to become so dependent on the outside experts that you're you're not self sufficient and you can't get rid of them. I mean, the whole point of you and I being consultants to organizations is we're good at coming in and doing what we're good at, but you don't want us around for a long time. Um, mm. As much as we might like each other, or you, you know, you like working with someone, you, you know, you want it to be a very targeted role. And you can't do that if you're not building that competency in-house. It's a lot harder to, to execute yeah. on. That. That's right. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I, I want to thank you for for being here today. Um, I, I would say I would I would love to say goodbye to the audience or, or say some closing words in Mandarin. But the only phrase I can recall from my time in Asia in Mandarin is uh, "shei shei." Is, is that how you say thank you? Is it "shei shei"? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You got it right. I, how do you how do you pronounce? I want to hear you say it though, just because I feel like you'll say it better than I did. Well, you say "xie xie da jia," so thank you, everyone. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you for thank you for being here today. Um, how can how can um, the audience get a hold of you if they're if they're in Asia Pacific and they want to talk to you about their digital transformations or their transformation needs? What uh, what are some of the ways they can get a hold of you? Yeah, so uh, you can get hold of me. The best way would be by email. So uh, my email is dean d e a n dot sam s a m at third stage hyphen consulting dot com. So dean dot sam third stage hyphen consulting dot com. Um, yeah. If uh, please, please do share uh, about your 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 ERP plans, and I'll, I'll be happy to 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 try to to, to help you out in any way possible, and, uh, and see uh, any 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 opportunities. And um, so I'm based in, out of Hong Kong. Uh, I have a colleague called Wayne, based out of uh, Brisbane in in Australia, and together we 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 work and and cater to to the Asia Pacific. Uh, region. So yeah. looking forward to, to hearing from all of you. All right. Thanks, Dean. That was really good stuff. And again, very applicable to digital transformations in Asia Pacific, but also any other part of the world too. I'd say most of those best practices you shared and that we talked about are things that apply to any sort of digital transformation. So we're going to unpack some of these topics that you covered here today or that you and I covered here today, and we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as Google, Amazon, Spotify, Apple 
Apple Podcasts, all the usual suspects for wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to us there. Leave us a review, subscribe, all that good stuff. We appreciate any support you can provide for this show. Um, so we just had Dean from Asia Pacific on the show. We talked about digital transformation within Asia Pacific. What were some of your thoughts or observations and takeaways from that conversation, Kyler? Yes. Well, my biggest takeaway is I, you know, was appalled. He had to work six days a week in in Bangladesh. <laughs> I know that was, that was a rough example. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think that it's so interesting. Um, the first time I interviewed Dean, um, I didn't know him that well because we hadn't crossed a ton of paths and he's, he's still newer to the organization. But it was interesting. I asked something that I usually try and corner my interviews e ease into, um, you know, the number one tactic of this and that. And I said the number one tactic to a digital transformation, a successful digital transformation. And, and he said organizational change management, which a lot of times in manufacturing specifically isn't at the top of the list, especially in more of emerging markets with less hard labor laws when it comes to manufacturing and and just an establishment, you would say, you know, you look at a lot of the businesses that that Dean um, consults with when we talk about heavy manufacturing, just overall cultures within um, our Asia Pacific region. And that really surprised me, the fact that he, you know, really took that human side of it to say like, hey, if you don't acknowledge the roles and responsibilities or explain them, communicate them within a manufacturing organization, you're going to experience severe disruption in your, your mm -hmm. overall um, ability to produce the final product or, you know, those raw materials that you send to any sort of buyer. Yeah, and it it also struck me the same way for maybe for a slightly different reason in that a lot of times Asian cultures are more hierarchical in nature mm -hmm. and they tend to, I don't want to say they respect authority more mm -hmm. than their countries, but I guess they, they're they less likely to challenge authority, mm -hmm. blatantly challenge authority. And so on the surface, you think, okay, well, that must mean the change management may not be as important in those types of cultures because... Or, or at least the perception is that it wouldn't be as important because of that hierarchical nature. Um, and same with manufacturing. I agree with what you said about manufacturing. A lot of times in manufacturing environments, leadership thinks that, hey, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the leadership team. They're going to change because we tell them to change. When I say them, I mean, the, you know, the frontline employees. But that's a, I liken that to situations. It would be like a coach for a, for a runner, let's just say, or, a, or any sort of sporting team, a basketball team or soccer team, football, whatever. Um, and it'd be like saying they're going to win because I tell them they're going to win. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not enough just to say you need to win. Mm -hmm. You need to tell them how they're going to win. You need to have a game plan. You need to communicate with them. You need to ensure they fully buy into the vision and understand the vision. And so it's, that's probably the best way I can think about it is in, in sports, you know, that is more of a, even more of a command and control sort of environment than the average business environment. Yet still you have to have that sort of, you know, we'll call it change management when really it's just coaching, it's leadership, it's communication, all the stuff that, you know, translates into good change management. It's the same sort of thing in any sort of transformation. So um, that that was surprising to me, though, that he that he saw it that way. And maybe it's because he has that, you know, multinational, multicultural background and understanding that could be part of it. Uh, but I, I, too, was surprised by that uh, being one of his first responses for sure. Yeah. And before our audience sounds off in the comments, Eric means football, not soccer, is what he means when he says. Well, I said both, just to hedge a little. Oh, did answer. you? Okay. <laughs> good, good. Just to make sure all of our football fans out there and rugby, we've learned a lot from our Australia team and South Africa team that rugby is where it's at. So um, stay and tuned. And cricket, for cricket for our uh, audience in India and other other parts right, of the world. Right. We're we're cricket. we're sports agnostic here at Thursday. Exactly we are. <laughs> Um, yeah, right. Uh, but I think that analogy is perfect. And that's really what Dean sees the role as a consultant to be able to do. And, and I'm wondering, um, from your work in Asia, and, you know, something that was a spinoff from your conversation with Dean, is how do you create that trust within those very tight knit organizations that tend to, you know, not always embrace the idea of outside consultants how do you especially when it's a different language and there's a lot of cultural differences there garner that trust and make sure that you're fulfilling the needs of the organization that might not always be extremely communicative or um, you know embrace your overall presence 
Well, I think the best way, and this is true, I think whether you're a outside consultant or even if you're an internal leader, is just to understand or seek to understand and ask questions and really dig into understanding the mindset of why people might resist change and to resist the temptation to not care because it, you know, it's in some ways leaders oftentimes think, well, it doesn't matter if uh, it doesn't matter why they're resisting the change. They just need to stop resisting the change and do what I say. Well, it's not that simple. If you really want them to change, you need to understand why they do things the way they do now and what potential obstacles there might be to them changing. And you kind of have to assume that most people are going to struggle to change, not because of anything against them, not because they're not competent or they're not capable of change. It's just that people don't want to change in, in general. And that I would say that about myself and probably for you and, you know, even people on the third stage team don't want to change. You know, we might be experts at change management, but that doesn't mean that we ourselves or as individual humans are always open to change because usually we're not. So, um, so anyway, so I think that's probably the best way I can think of it to build that trust is just to understand. And I found really early in my career, when I started out, I was in my mid twenties, I think I was 24 years old, somewhere around there when I started consulting. And I was really young and I got a lot of criticism for being so young and being a consultant. And, and uh, I know others that have had that same problem, but the best way I found to navigate that and to build trust and credibility wasn't because I knew all there was to know about a business or operations because I didn't, because I was so young. It was by asking questions and really seeking to understand and empathize with the people and with the organization that, that we're dealing with. So that's probably the best advice I could think of. That's interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, extremely important, both externally and internally, when you are communicating any sort of change or just listening, as you always kind of teach us that that is really, truly the job of the consultant. I do have one other question um, when we wrap up kind of our, our unpacking of, of Dean's interview. It's almost like a little bit of a devil's advocate type of thing. So he mentioned the importance of organizational change. But sometimes in manufacturing, I think it's almost the software a lot of times that you choose as opposed to the organizational change element. And obviously there's a hybrid between the two, but how difficult is it as a manufacturing organization that we know is heavy within the culture of Asia Pacific to choose a software that truly meets your needs as an organization? Sounds like a, a really tall order. Yeah, it's a tall order for, for any organization in any part of the world, but certainly manufacturing organizations have pretty complex operations in general, especially those that are engineer to order or make to order sorts of engineering environments. Or if uh, you're a manufacturer that produces uh, any sort of chemical or food and beverage or things that require a recipe, you know, of, of uh, you know, process manufacturing requirements. Um, those those are examples of areas that are very complex so you really do want to find the software that fits your needs because if it doesn't meet your core fundamental business needs it's not gonna you know you're, you're not gonna be able to work your way around that effectively in terms of making the software do something it wasn't built to do you're gonna end up customizing or you're gonna end up doing some sort of third-party bolt-on neither of which is the end of the world but it's certainly not ideal by any means Gotcha. Absolutely. Well, great interview with Dean. And for all of um, our listeners, I did tag him on um, our LinkedIn live stream. So it, it, that always exists on our YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and, and check that out um, to connect with Dean. Um, we also have our um, APAC regional digital stratosphere event that's coming up on June 28th. The registration is open and the event is completely free. So if you do have any interest in learning some more about specific software selection, executive alignment, um, overall system integrator, vendor management, those types of things, Dean, Eric, and Wayne are all going to present on on that. So definitely um, head over to our website, our events page. You can uh, You can register right there. Um, and save your spot for that exciting event later in June. Yeah, and if you're not watching this podcast or listening to this podcast in a timely manner, if you're listening to it months later or after that event happens, you can still go to that link after the fact and uh, stream the recording of the event. Um, you just put in your your contact info and you'll get access to that. So uh, even if you can't catch it live or you, you learn about it after the fact, be sure to check that as well. So it's a good, good point. And we also have our 
our uh, Stratosphere 2022 event, which is a more, call it a more global event that we did early in 2022. Uh, I think it was February of 2022. Um, we still have those recordings out there that you can go download or stream by going to stratosphere2022.com. So uh, there's 15 or 16 different workshop sessions and training sessions out there, covers a wide variety of digital transformation topics. So you can check that out as well. Well, good stuff. Well, well, thanks for that uh, debrief, that some good follow-up questions and discussion there. Um, we're going to shift gears sort of, but it's actually a natural transition because coincidentally, our next guest is also from third stage Asia Pacific, although he's not going to be talking about anything specific to Asia Pacific. He's going to be talking about business process mining. So we're going to come back with Wayne Holtham after the break. He's going to give us an overview of business process mining, which by the way, was a presentation he gave at the Stratosphere 2022 event earlier this year, which again, you can go watch all of the sessions at stratosphere2022.com. But we're going to play you the clip of this particular session after the break, and we're going to unpack it as well. Um, so we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Tyler Cheatham, and we're going to shift gears a bit and cover a really cool topic that I really like. It's, it's uh, one of the things I've enjoyed the most learning about in recent years of my uh, consulting career. And the way I've learned about this topic was through our next guest, uh, Wayne Holtham, who is not only the head of our third stage Asia Pacific office, he's based in Brisbane, Australia. Um, he's not only the head of that office and the leader of that office, but he's also our sort of in-house resident expert in business process mining. And this is a really cool development in the industry, uh, largely because it gives us a more quantitative and a more scientific way to analyze actual business processes. Um, and so rather than me trying to explain it, let's, uh, let's go ahead and cut to the clip of Wayne, who's going to give an overview of business process mining. He'll talk about where and how it can be used and what some of the benefits are and how to get started on the business process mining journey, all that stuff. So let's cut to the presentation of, of Wayne Holtham talking about business process mining. Process mining. Um, it's, it's one of those terminologies that will always come up with new terminology and how we actually um, do things. But <clears throat> it's important to, um, to, to think that process mining is, is probably uh, we have now the ability to be able to see things we couldn't see before. And just to give you a bit of a feel, uh, I think I, uh, and uh, hopefully you don't feel I'm too old, but um, you know, it's about 45 years since I commenced work. And so in that time, um, you, you, you learn and pick up a few things and processes uh, have always been one of those, uh, I suppose, challenges that people have of, you know, when we start something, we do something, we have a routine, we have a process, we, we go about the way we do something the same way sort of thing. And then we bring someone else into an organization and they come along and they have their own set of views and we end up with a whole lot of processes that we hope are the consistent or the way that we want them done. So, um, so what we find is that over time, um, those processes can be different. You know, the way people do things, we change roles. Um, and as we've gone into the world of digital enablement, we find that that's becoming more and more of a challenge for us because where we could cope with the fact that people could do processes a certain way and, and we could accommodate that and when they went on leave or holidays or left the organization, someone would come in and pick it up and we'd do a different way, but we'd still get the, the service delivered or what we were looking to achieve. Um, as, as we work through, you know, um, now with enterprise um, technologies, we have the thing where process mining is becoming 
well, how, how do we how do we understand what processes we're all doing? Do we all do it the same? Uh, does that cause inefficiencies? How do we get consistency? And so, um, in my in my past life, as I mentioned many many years ago, back in the late nineties. There was a, a process that came out where we talked about process re-engineering. So we'd actually look at organisations, we would unpack what they do, and we would actually then try and align the processes. Um, it worked well for smaller organisations, but when we talk about big organisations, global organisations, very difficult because you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it, you know, just even the, the fact that there's a huge number of people involved in the process. And so... Process mining is something that technology has given us. In my mind, it's the crystal ball. It's that thing that says, all of a sudden, how do we, what are we doing? How can we actually go in and improve? <clears throat> how do we monitor what we're actually doing? So, um, so, so yes, it's, uh, it's, it's a new world. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity. And you can probably tell I'm a bit excited about it because uh, over the last four years, I've been involved in uh, working with organizations and, um, and what I could see back in the late 90s where we were actually uh, re-engineering processes, a lot of the processes were manual and they didn't rely on uh, digital um, platforms to support them. Whereas today, we, we, we truly have embraced digital platforms and we need consistency. We need people to be able to do things the same way. And if we want to automate, we want to do AI, we want to do robotics, that's what it works on. It works on the fact of consistency of process. And if we don't have anything like that, it's very difficult to actually put in automation. So as we walk through today, we'll actually have a bit of a look at um, uh, process discovery. You know, it's one of the things we've many times, um, people will have, organizations will have gone through a discovery of uh, their processes. We'll look at the barriers to process mining because there are distinct barriers um, that, that people have and they aren't the barriers you might think. It's, it's not that it's hard to do and it's not that it's that it's that taking that quantum leap into something that uh, may actually show a reality you don't want to see. So we'll talk about that as well. We'll look at the benefits of process mining and we'll also look at the process performance measurement. And I think that's an important thing because it's not about understanding just what your processes are. It's making sure that they stay the same and operate the same and provide the same level of performance as you design them to be ongoing, evergreen. And so, so to me, that's a very important step for, um, for process um, effectiveness, uh, which, which supports all of your digital um, um, platforms and how they actually operate. So this is third stage has, uh, has had this around for a while. And if you've looked at many of the um, LinkedIn posts, you might have seen uh, a process, um, process review, a process of how you go about um, uh, understanding your processes and improving processes to support a digital strategy or a roadmap or a, or a, um, or a change program. So, so you know, these, <clears throat> these are the basic steps that we would go through. But when we start looking at what is available as tools to be able to help us do that, current state is always one of those areas that we go, well, that's, we need to probably understand current state before we move forward to actually implement future state, because that guides what change we might need, um, how much effort we have to actually put in, what type of uh, interfaces or what type of architecture we might need in our uh, digital uh, platform. And so, so you know, that, they're an important step to be able to get us to the future state. But I suppose the one thing we're looking at is when we are triggered by a, a digital platform or we are putting in a new platform, we find that um, we need to understand why are we doing it? What are the goals? What are, what's our objectives? What are, what are our, how are we going to operate differently in a new world? So, um, so that, that's, that's obviously a first step. And then we get into the current, um, evaluate our current processes. It's, you know, identify what our future should be. You know, are we going to get any benefits out of it? What are the metrics that we actually are going to measure those processes? And in the past, it would have been hard to be able to do those things. It's hard to actually measure process performance because how do we measure it? Whereas a lot of process mining tools allow us to be able to um, keep a look on, keep an eye out, keep a view on how, how things are performing. 
Um, and then I've obviously identify the change impacts. If we have thousands of ways, and, and in some organisations that we've worked with, there are literally thousands of variants to the way organisations do processes. And, uh, and that's usually, usually because over time they've grown and people have done different things. Um, technology may be harder to use, they've created workarounds. And so you get all of these different variants. And then when we come in and we say, we want to put in best practice. Best practice is about saying, well, we want consistency. We want it done a certain way. We want a certain a level of alignment across the organization. And so that's, that's the, probably the, the challenge that most organizations have. And that's where a lot of failures come from, is that fact that you know, they don't understand that they actually do their process or the way they go about their business differently across geographies, across different divisions, across all areas of the business. And so... One of the big steps is to be able to bring that back, align that, get that back at, so that it's as close as it can. Then best practice has a chance. Then automation has an opportunity. Then robotics has an opportunity. And so when we start looking at where process mining comes in, we start looking at here's where process mining can actually help us. You know, evaluating our current processes. For me, I call that what is because it's what is actually happening. And I'll go into what I mean by that, but, but that term what is, is something that really is special to me in the sense that, you know, I've sat in lots of sessions where we do current state and you'll talk to a group of people and then you bring in a different group of people and they'll have a different version of how they do things. So what is really current state? What do we really do? Whereas when we look at the process mining tools that um, we have today, we get the ability to be able to see what is. And that's where that's your base. That's your that's your ability to be able to work on that. And then we can start to say, well, what should those new processes be look like? How how can we actually clean out some of those things that are causing us disruption, variance, need to change? And it may be that our master data is not right. It may be that we have to have a workaround for certain things. How do we get that so that that's not an issue for us? And that's where those benefits start coming. So how do we get streamlined processes? They are the sorts of things that. Um, that we're looking to achieve. Um, and then, then obviously it's about process ownership and metrics. So how do we keep them like that? You know, if they, are, if they aren't working for us, how do we get it so that we actually are going to focus on those and improve those? And so these are all of the things where the process mining tools allow us to be able to, um, to, to get that insight to be able to work on it. But I suppose let's go back to the first step of define the business goals. How do we want to operate? that sets the scene for many of the steps that follow after. But you can see here the old way that we would do it. And so many, many post-it notes, many days, many weeks. And a lot of consulting firms actually build a career on this because they know that um, this isn't a simple process. And when you've got to get a lot of people involved, you have to get a clear understanding. And, and you, you need to probably have a bit of skill when it comes to the facilitation piece of this to be able to really challenge, is that really how it happens or is that how it happens in this division? And so what you end up with is that, that fiction or that best guess. And, and that's always a challenge because if we're moving forward and we're going to put in a digital platform and we might spend millions and millions of dollars putting in what we call best practice, yet we operate in a way that isn't really clear or we have many ways of doing it, it makes it difficult for us to actually go and, and, and get that, um, that digital platform to actually work as efficiently and as effective and uh, for us. So, so that's the challenge. Whereas if we look on the right hand side, Here's what process mining does, and, and the tool that we use is, uh, that we, and I'm not saying it's, it's the only tool to use, there are a number of tools out there, Signavio is a tool, um, spoke to a client just recently and there's a Microsoft based tool that's out there for some of the Microsoft products. But the one, uh, Salonis actually does all of the major uh, ERP uh, digital platforms. So, so first tier, second tier, there's plugins for all of those. Um, so, so it probably covers the widest range and, and it's recognized in the marketplace as being probably the leader when it comes to process mining tools. So, so, um, so, so that's, that's, I suppose, a bit of background on the tool set. But let's, let's not focus on the tool. Let's, let's focus on what it actually gives us. And if we look on the right-hand side there, we can see a few squiggly lines. That is actually a process. And that's a process that actually 
um, which is a standard process. In this case, it's actually in an asset management space, and so we have work orders, and uh, you know we complete that work, and then we close it out. And so that's what this this is representing for us. But you can see here that in this we have 87 different variants of that one process. So that means that in our organisation we do it 87 times different. And so you go, well, it's very hard for us to be able to say, well, if we're implementing best practice, which one of those 87 is our best practice? And so the, the, the aim is to be able to say, well, what's causing us to have to do these things or have these variants or have these differences in what we do? And so this is, this is what gives us that. And that's why I talk about it being a crystal ball. This is the, the view that we actually have. And we can drill down and continue and look at every one of those 87 uh, different variants. In this case here, I think we're looking at the top seven there. Um, and that gives us a view of what we can actually change, where our differences are, why they're actually happening. And the, the lower screen actually starts to give us a view of um, drilling down. So we could actually pick at any one of those points and find out how often it happens, when it happens, what's the, what's the circumstance it happens under. And, and so, so all of a sudden, you actually have really good fact, really clear detail. And, and for some people, that's quite challenging because in the past, you know, they, they built a career on hiding behind their process and they were the only one who could do that. And when, when they went on leave or they went out of the system, all of a sudden the business felt it. And so for them, they really were needed. You know, it's that, it's that thing of, you know, you can't lose me out of the organization because you wouldn't survive as such. And so, you know, that's, that, that are some of those things that cause the challenges we have when we're implementing new digital platforms is the fact that we have humans and humans like to do things their own way. Um, but if we want to embrace technology, we want to improve, we want to actually get um, automation, rely on artificial intelligence, do all of those sorts of things, we need to be able to start to understand what are those differences? Why do we have them? Are they of any value? Do we need them? And what is probably the most simplest way to be able to do things? And when we have organizations that have been around for a long time, you can imagine how much legacy, how much background. And, and it's interesting uh, when you go into organizations, sometimes you find a process and you say, why do you do that process? Well, I don't know. I was taught to do it when I came in and that was 20 years ago. And we, we still do it. But we've got another process that we, we were told we had to do. So we do that one and that one. And so we end up with this lot of duplication. And, and these are things that, um, that we want to we wanna remove out of our organizations. We want to be able to get what's the smoothest, simplest, frictionless way of doing a process. And so it's important for us to be able to identify what is happening. And that's why I talk about what is. It's the factual, it's the detailed. We're here with Wayne Holtham talking about business process mining. We have a lot more to cover, but we're going to take a quick break first. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. We're here with Wayne Holtham talking about business process mining. Barriers, <laughs> and this is something you, you, you know, most people go, oh, what's the barrier to it? Is it hard to put in? Is it difficult? Well, essentially what it is, it's a, it's a connection into your data set because every time you actually transact in your 
digital platform, you leave a fingerprint or a footprint, whichever whichever you want to call it. And that that leaves us a, a trail of a trail of breadcrumbs to be able to put together those maps you would have seen there earlier, where we're saying, well, this is what actually happened at this stage, and this took this diversion, and this took this. So we can actually follow that without having to sit in a room and ask people, what do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? Because all of a sudden we have it available to us. The next piece for us is to be able to say, well, okay, now we know that, why do we do it? Does it add any value? Different discussion, but it's one of those things you've got to get to that point. And the big challenge is, is when you start looking at whole business, enterprise, we need to involve our senior leaders. And many of our senior leaders really don't understand, and I'm not being disrespectful here because it's not their role to probably understand every intricate detail. But with that comes a blind side. It becomes a, a blind spot of an organization. And so, you know, they are reported certain metrics to say, here's how we are performing. But no one ever uh, puts a metric up that says, we are red in every quadrant. Uh, we perform really, really badly. It's only until really it gets to that point where you, there's no other choice. You can't choose any other color but red um, that you do it. And so getting senior leaders to actually see the value of consistent process, defining processes, you know, uh, leveraging the, uh, an efficiency program instead of managing inefficiency. It's, it's a challenge. And so when, 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 the, you know, when you're working with organizations, you know, there's often this, this hesitation to actually adopt what I call the new world of digital, um, digital process mapping. Um, because, because people go, well, you know, I'm not sure what it's going to show me and I'm not sure I trust what it says. But when you actually get in and you actually start looking at it, we, we worked with a client just recently where, you know, they wanted a, a design, a process design. And uh, what they got is they got a learning of, of how many different ways they do things. They actually learned that there were so many different ways and workarounds, they actually never used their ERP to its potential. I think it's about two or 3% of uh, people actually use the ERP. They reported into it. They didn't actually transact in it. And so these are all learnings to say, well, if I'm gonna spend millions of dollars putting in a new ERP platform or a new technology platform, I want people to actually use it, not not have it there and just, you know, how can we trust the information that's in it? So so senior leaders, you know, it's, it's a key thing for them to be able to embrace the ability to say, well, let's look at what we do. Let's, let's, let's uh, not think that we are perfect. Let's think, let's understand, let's discover, let's look at what is possible. An effective process uh, involvement is only effective when it's improved end to end. Many times we'll have organization, I've worked with different divisions of organizations and they come in and they go, you know, I want you to uh, look at our processes and we want to we want to map them and we want to fix them. And you go, well, you have a f input area or you have an area where another division feeds you uh, information service, whatever, and you, you have an output. So your piece you could improve, but how do you know that if you're actually getting information or, or getting uh, materials or, or, or you're part of a process that is an end-to-end -end process, you just improving your piece doesn't actually add value to the whole organization. And so you need to take a step back and not have that silo uh, view of processes. It's, it's one of those things that uh, organizations, we've divisionalized organizations over time, but we do need to take that step up and say, well, many of the divisions need one to support the other to deliver the other. And that's where this end-to-end -end, um, um, concept, or and it's not even a concept, it's actually a reality, uh, has come in. A real barrier that you find is when you actually work with organizations and often you come in at, the, at a lower level in the organization and they see you know, the, the potential of, um, uh, of process mining or improving processes. But the challenge they have is that many of the people that they have to convince to actually get to do process mining or, or really good process um, improvement have, have a, are tied to those processes. They don't want to be reflected in a negative way. And so by looking in at that data and seeing all of those breadcrumbs and all of those differences of the way they do things, they feel it judges them. And, and it's not about judging, it's about saying, well, now we actually have a basis. We have a baseline to actually work from. Not a guess, 
not a not a you know not a not someone's interpretation or they think they do it that way or they'd like to do it that way but they don't really want to tell you that that's not done that way um so 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 that's one of the areas it's very difficult to be able to break that little barrier and then end-to-end -end process ownership and measurement it's not understood so many times we have um you know and and this just as a recent um uh, experience we had a large consulting firm came in and they talked about putting in end-to-end -end processes to an organization that was very silo based it had a lot of different divisions it was vertically integrated at 10,000 employees so it's a reasonable size business and um, and so that their level of process ownership was that they had their little piece of the process that they felt they owned but they you know and they were responsible for but did it enhance any other area of the business? Could it be measured? No, it couldn't be. And so that, that's one of the challenges that organizations face is that when they look at processes, they look at processes on a divisional base. And so you need to look at process ownership at a level where people can actually make the difference and view what performance needs to be. And you can also monitor how that is continually operating. So you've actually got the feedback saying that this process is still working as efficient as it can be. And when it's not, we're mature enough to actually say, what's going wrong? How do we fix that? And we pick it up and learn it quickly before we actually let it get out of hand. We create a workaround and we add something else in and we get more complexity. And then soon as soon as we've actually started complexity, it continues to grow because all of a sudden we create that domino effect. We fix one thing, we break another. Whereas when we look at end to end, we can make sure the whole, the whole uh, line of the process is actually seamless. Benefits. And, and for me, there's, there's a lot more that, uh, benefits on it than, than I actually have listed on here. And I, at the end of this session, I'll, I'll finish early and we'll ask some questions about what people think about um, whether they've seen benefits or whether they could see some of the benefits. So I won't wrap it on the whole time. So apologies for, uh, for just running through the presentation, but it, but it gives us a basis to work from. So, you know, accurate what is process flows. They act as that baseline, as I mentioned. It's something that you can't underestimate knowing what really is happening because only then can you actually start to address and rectify and align because once you get people aligned and understand you i don't even know why we do that or that doesn't even make sense to do some of those things then that alignment piece is a critical part and it supports your change and change becomes a much easier process when people go i don't even I, i'm not fighting this change because it makes sense for us to do that um, because i can see the value that it actually creates Clarity, how many different ways of a process is carried out? And so when we can actually start to see why all those workarounds are in there or what is causing those workarounds. So it's not always people doing it wrong. It's they have to in some cases because the business actually hasn't got maturity in some areas of their business. You know, they may have poor data that's actually causing some of this. Um, or they may have never been trained to actually use a system so they actually find it easy to slip out into a spreadsheet and do some work and then, then push those numbers back in. Which, which challenge is, do we actually have a source of truth anymore, um, is probably the question that you raise is there. And then we look at process effectiveness. If we actually measure the performance of a process, then that becomes evergreen. If we ever do anything else in the way of putting in a new digital platform, a new change to the business, we have a really clear understanding of how our business operates. Whereas today, many businesses don't have that. And so they embark on, a, 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 it's like a mystery tour of how to actually put in a digital platform where I don't even know what processes we do. I don't know what the impact's gonna be by putting in best practice. And so at the end of our delivery, we find that we've got these gaps. You know, all of a sudden, it, it doesn't do it the way we used to do it because we had 10 spreadsheets that we relied on to actually give us this information. And so, so you can see why there's so many uh, challenges and risks that come with digital transformation. And this is one of those ways of it's a, a risk buster uh, in the sense that um, you actually get the ability to see what you're actually doing. 
um, adopt best practice. And, and best practice is one of those things that, you know, there is world's best practice, and I hear that so often. Um, but, but what's best practice for your organization to maintain a competitive advantage? And I think that's the difference. If we look at a lot of the disruptors that have come out in recent times, your Ubers, your, your all of those sorts of uh, organizations that come in and have actually built a market where there was uh, already an existing market and they've actually muscled their way in and created a new market. And so it takes a lot to do that. But why have they done that? It's because they actually have a very efficient process that allows them to actually come in and be very efficient at what they do. Whereas what, what's happened in the past, a lot of these other uh, providers in particular industries have found that you know their processes get them by, they service a delivery, but they aren't as efficient as they could be. They're not the cheapest way of doing things and, and they, they are not always deliver the best way. And so, so the ability to be able to adopt best practice that satisfies your competitive advantage is really, really important. Ability to align technology. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we look to technology as, you know, it's the savior. It's gonna have all the processes in it. It's gonna have best practice. Well, it has technology practice. That doesn't mean it's the best practice. And if we look at an enterprise platform, we sell that across many industries, many organizations. So are we all gonna be the same best practice? So how do we get our business to align the processes that we have with the technology, the technology will have a way of working. And so that's what they determine as best practice. And so how do we get that? And so if we can actually see what processes we do, where the touch point is with technology, all of a sudden we remove that air gap, that, that, that um, area where we are, we're not sure of, or we have misalignment, which creates many of those reasons why we have workarounds. Process performance measurement. To me, this is the holy grail. To be able to actually look at and monitor your processes, and you can see here, here's a couple of um, images where you can actually put a dashboard in. So in this case here, it's throughput time. So how long does it take to actually do the process? You know, um, if we've got different steps within a process, uh, we can actually break that process down to actually see um, whether one particular step is holding up the overall. Um, What's the closest way to get our our best variant as such or our best process? So it might not be that it's totally straight line with the process. There might be a couple of little areas where we deviate, but that's actually our best process to satisfy our competitive advantage. And so having this presented to us and our managers and our senior managers, all of a sudden gives them the ability to be able to make sure that what they are looking to do or how they're actually working uh, in an organization, what the objectives are, are they being met? Are we doing it the smoothest, simplest way? And focusing on those particular areas of the business that aren't, so that you can actually quickly work on those, then let everything get out of control or create a fix here, which forces a fix over here, and we have those sort of problems. And so digital transformations are often larger uh, than required because, you know, often, we don't understand what we're actually venturing into. And so we find that we get halfway along the journey and we didn't estimate or didn't assume that that would be a problem for us. And so then we've got to go off and fix that. And so that's where we get this time blowout and this cost blowout. And having that clear understanding of the what is reduces your transformation requirement. So for every improvement or upgrade that you might do in the future, as I mentioned, it allows you to be able to um, you know, to be able to address that because you actually understand what you're doing. And so again, it's even cheaper when you actually engage a solution integrator. They come in and they go, well, ah, that's the process you want us to work to. We can build a solution that will actually support that. So the cost becomes cheaper. The efficiency, the outcomes become cheaper. And so there's a whole lot of benefits to actually understanding what is uh, and then working through that process to actually deliver a better outcome. All right, thank you, Wayne. That's a great presentation. And uh, that's the second time I've seen the presentation now. And I learn more every time I hear him talk about business process mining. So it's a really good session. And I appreciate you, you providing that here today. Uh, we're going to come back after a break and we're going to talk a little bit more about business process mining. So we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. 
Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 70. We just had Wayne Holtham on the show to talk about business process mining. Uh, Kyler, what were some of your observations and takeaways from that conversation? Yeah, so we had Wayne on um, a few months back for our Transformation Ground Control, obviously this podcast. And that was kind of an overview of business process mining, like what it can do for your operations, strategic tactics. But this was actually um, an example of business process mining. So if you're listening to this on an audio platform, though, you can still hear everything he says if you want to see the visuals. You can head over to our YouTube page as well. Um, if you're if you're listening. So just a, a note on that um, to to look at that presentation. Um, so I have questions on business process mining real quick, just to clarify. I, mean, I know, right? So <laughs> say you're an organization that's like business process mining, great idea, you know, definitely something I want to get into and utilizing those events, those logs, those types of data points. What if you don't have those exact data points? Is there anything that you can use to analyze from your existing data without actually turning on the system? Like, is there any pre-work you can do or uh, it's kind of set the stage for, okay, now I'm going to get the actual process mining software. But right now I, I want to have some sort of analysis of my overall business processes. So you're asking if, if you can use the business process mining software if you don't have technology or if you haven't automated a process or. So I, yeah. So if you haven't, if you don't have the exact data points that the, the business process mining software, like Wayne kind of went over, so you don't have those right now, you're turning it on. Is there anything mm -hmm. that you can do today before you purchase that software or subscribe to it to really analyze your business processes from that granular level as almost like pre-work to understand um, the impacts of business process mining. Well, it's, I don't know that there's pre-work other than making sure that your, your data is clean and that you're capturing mm -hmm. transaction logs and things like that. Um, I don't know if you could necessarily go back and fix stuff, you know, retroactively if it, if it wasn't already in place, but um, generally the way, business process mining software works from what I understand is it'll go in and log according to the software and the way the software tracks or doesn't track mm -hmm. certain milestones and processes uh, throughout. So every, you know, business process mining software in general is, is pretty technology agnostic in terms of what sorts of technologies it can work with. Okay. So it has to be able to interact with any, any sort of web-based um, technology, whether it's an ERP system, supply chain or HCM, CRM or whatever. Um, so it's going to conform to whatever uh, data does exist, and it's not going to be able to necessarily read into anything beyond what data is already there. So I guess that's a, I don't know if that's a downside necessarily, but they just hasn't figured out a way to do anything beyond what the software is already capturing from, from what I understand. Yeah, interesting. I didn't realize it could go in and kind of absorb existing data um, and kind of take that into consideration and analyze that. So I think that's a, a great kind of point of clarification. If you are looking at starting this process, there is power in your current data, right? So making sure that your your data, master data management strategies are aligned so that your data is optimized will be a, a great tactic to ensure that the business process mining software can effectively make a, a positive business value um, for your organization. Um, yeah, just to clarify those those examples that that um, that Dean that uh, sorry not Dean Dean was earlier Wayne the, the examples that Wayne went through uh, on the process mining in terms of the actual um, labels or the processes that were being measured 
those weren't fields that were driven by the process mining software. Okay. The okay. process mining software drew those data points out of the existing software that's being used. So again, that nomenclature, those fields, that data, it was driven by the software it was pulling from, not from the process mining Maybe. software. Makes sense. Gotcha. Maybe everybody else understood that and I just didn't. But, you know, for all no, of you, um, you, um, you knew new to business process mining that I think that's a good point of clarity is there that it really does kind of sounds like it conforms to your overall business needs and your KPIs as an organization, which is. And whatever cool. system or systems you have in place, that's what it has to work with. And, you know, that's both a good thing and, and a bad thing, but I'd say it's mostly a good thing because mm -hmm. no, up until now, no other tool has been able to go in and really quantify and visualize what's actually happening. I think intuitively people kind of think they know what's happening day to day with their operations, but this really quantifies it, visualizes it, and it tells you what's really happening. And it gets to a really granular level, at least to the degree that your, your software they're using captures that granular level. Absolutely. That's a, a great point. And and on and building on that, what is the difference between business process mining and business process discovery? Well, I'd say that business process mining is a form of business mm -hmm. process discovery. So business process discovery or business process analysis or assessing a current state or process improvement, you in all those buckets, you're you're analyzing the current state to figure out how to make it better. One way to analyze the current state to figure out how to make it better is to use process mining data or business process mining tools to give you the data and the insights into what's actually happening. You can also have other qualitative conversations like with our consulting teams, for example, when we're doing business process work, we'll stu still do the uh, sort of the whiteboard process discussions to understand just how processes flow and what you know that that macro view of the organization is. But the business process mining software gives us data and insights to augment that qualitative discussion. So in our case, those are the two main forms of business process analysis that we use. And then, of course, we use our library of business process best practices and uh, frameworks that we, we have a bunch of business process frameworks that we use in, in analyzing processes and figuring out the future state. Uh, but those are just a few examples. So it, it kind of fits within that, that mm -hmm. broader bucket. Yeah, I think that's helpful to understand definitely that, you know, it's a kind of a, a method to the overall strategic development. So thank you for explaining that. Um, another another term we hear kind of thrown out when it comes to business process mining is um, task mining. So that, you know, going down to a more granular level of overall optimization, that seems like a, a lot of detail and it seems like it might get really easy to get down into the weeds of something. And maybe that's the point. Right. Um, but I wanted to get kind of your feedback on are, are we mining too deep at some point or how do you how do you keep from kind of falling into the weeds on these overall tasks as opposed to strategic development on an enterprise level? Yeah, that's a great question. It, you know, I, I don't. I don't know that I, have a, that I have a great one size fits all answer for that, other than to say that that granular level of detail and analysis that you can get out of business process mining will help you drill into or focus on the areas that are most ripe for improvement. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you might do business process mining down at that task level and get, you know, say a thousand different tasks. You know, let's just say you get a thousand different tasks and data for a thousand different tasks. You're not going to go into excruciating detail to re-engineer all thousand of those tasks necessarily, but you might identify 50 of those thousand that are, there's a high degree of variation or there's uh, there's some sort of breakdown in the process or the data is not flowing through that process the way it should, or there's a bottleneck. And that allows you to really, it gives you the data and the insights to know where you should focus your time and effort on improving the processes. So in other words, not treating all your processes equally but really looking for that low hanging fruit and the parts of your business and the tasks and the processes that are most ripe for, for improvement. Interesting. Well, that's a, a great overview. And I highly suggest if you have any questions about business process mining or mapping or discovery or whatever we want to call it, definitely.
Wooten is a wealth of knowledge. So feel free to reach out to him directly, um, connect with him on LinkedIn, or you can always email me at kyler.cheatham at thirdstage-consulting.com and I can connect you um, with Wayne as well. Um, he always loves to engage with our audience and he has a, a wealth of experience within this overall industry and, and performs this service for a lot of our clients that creates a really lucrative outcome. So yeah. Thank you for going through that with us, Eric, and, and I'm excited to hear more from Wayne at our regional digital stratosphere event for APAC. Um, again, you can go to our website and register for that, or if you are listening um, past our June 28th date, you can always see the recordings as well if you do go through the registration process. Great. Yep. Be sure to check that out. That'll be a good event, and it's part of our ongoing live event series and our stratosphere series as well, so uh, be sure to check that out. Well, good. Well, I, I want to thank Wayne and Dean and you, Kyler, for helping us put on a great show again this week. Uh, next week, we are going to have an exciting episode. We're going to actually do our top 10 interviews for 2022 so far. So that'll be me kind of counting down some of the best interview clips and, and give you my, my rendition or my uh, ranking of the top 10 interviews that we've done so far. We've done dozens of interviews so far this year, and we're going to pick the best ones and the highlights from those best ones. Uh, and showcase them all in our episode next week. So be sure to check that out. And again, you can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday morning, uh, U.S. time uh, on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, as well as all the audio podcast platforms. So be sure to check us out, subscribe, leave us a review, share feedback, any suggestions for topics, all that stuff. We're really open to making the show about you and, and the topics that are going to best benefit you. So thanks, everyone, for making the show uh such a great one. And thanks to the audience for listening in and providing great feedback. Have a great week and we'll look forward to seeing you next week on Transformation Ground Control.